Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. Uh, in this video we are going to talk about uh, all sorts of numerical analysis type of stuff. So, let's get started. The first thing we can do is uh, solving equations with one variable. So, an example of this is how, where, where can we find where certain equations cross zero? Or maybe, uh, like in the terms that we might have used in the previous video, uh, the roots of an equation. But when we talk about solving an equation, uh, we're talking about finding where that equation crosses zero. Um, note that when I say crosses zero, I mean goes either from negative to positive or positive to negative. Uh, we can't have equations, but we can find places where the equation touches zero and goes back. So we can't do something like negative to negative or positive to positive. My lab only lets us uh, use these methods to find places where, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the x-intercept is crossed. But regardless, what we're doing is given a certain function, we want to find where f of x equals zero. So those of you who might have uh, done this on a, maybe like a TI-83 or something back in the day, uh, some sort of old graphing calculator, you might recognize the uh, method that we're doing here. But basically, the first thing we want to do in order to find the, um, in order to find where a function crosses a, uh, the x-intercept is, well, right here, what I have is I have the anonymous function detailing your function. In this case, it's f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 4. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this from x equals negative 5 to x equals 5. And let's see what that looks like. And yeah, so that is our parabola. And you can see that um, uh, x equals 0 kind of passes by right there. Let me actually uh, add that into the plot as well. Um, let's see if I can do this live. I should, probably should have tested this beforehand, but let's see how that changes. Uh, it does not change anything as it turns out. That is unfortunate. Um, well, that's fine. Regardless, uh, this is the plot we are given. So you can see that it does cross zero a couple of times. So we can, what we can actually try to do is figure out, okay, well, here's about where it crosses zero. Like where about is this crossing zero? So as you might be able to see right now, um, I'm, I'm hovering over a spot where it's really close to zero. So it looks like at three, it gets really close to zero. And also at negative 1, at x equals negative 1, it also gets really close to 0. So what we can do is we can use these estimates of like, okay, negative 1 is really close to 0, 3 is close to 0. We can use these estimates to help MATLAB find an exact point where the uh, function crosses 0. And we're going to do this using the f0 function. So we say that uh, we use the f0 function. Basically, we pass in a function. And we can either use an anonymous function like what I have below, or we can use a string representing a, fu a function in MATLAB syntax. So I'll give an example of that uh, in just a bit. But for now, we're going to focus just on um, using the anonymous function version of this. x0 is a x value that we know is close to where the co function crosses 0. And what that means is that MATLAB will actually use that point to start trying to figure out, okay, well, if I advance, say, by, like, 1, does it, uh, do I go from negative to positive or positive to negative? So it's like, if our x0 is 3, for example, do we cross the x-intercept between 3 and 4 or 2 and 3? All right, I guess between 2 and 4, do we cross the x-intercept? Yes? Okay, what about between 3 and a half and 2 and, uh, two and a half and 3 and a half? Do we cross the, uh, do we cross the x-intercept? Yes or no? Okay. And it kind of tightens that bound. But 3 is going to be the starting point for MATLAB. So uh, that that's sort of what x0 is. is we, we say that it's, it's close to where the function crosses 0, and MATLAB will use that to start searching for the exact, or very close to the exact x-intercept. And then x, the output, is the exact point, the exact x value where the function crosses 0. So I'm going to comment out this code right here, and I'm going to uncomment the code that actually lets us see where um, two of the x-intercepts are. So based on the estimation that we did from the graph, I'm putting in two x0 values, 3 and negative 1. So let's take a look 
here and we can see that the x-intercepts are 3.2361 and negative 1.2361. So we can actually check that out. Let's say f applied to 3.2361 is, uh, well, that's my bad. Let me do something like this. Uh, x equals, or let's call it x int. So now um, if we run this again, uh, oh, you know what it is? Is I have redefined f. So that's my bad. Um, okay, let's try this again. And let's take a look at... Uh, f applied to x int of 1 should be 0, and f applied to x int of 2 should also be 0. It's very close to 0, within a MATLAB amount of random error. So that's uh, the answer that's giving us is about negative 4 times 10 to the negative 16th, which is extremely small. So within rounding error, both of these are f or uh, x-intercepts. So... Another way we can use the f0 function is I'm going to comment this out and let's take a look at this right here. So you'll see that as a string I have x squared minus 2 times x minus 4 in both of these rather than using the anonymous function. So note that I've still typed in MATLAB code, I just put it into a string. And if we do this, um, we'll basically still get the same answer. Right? Actually, we get exactly the same answer from this. So what MATLAB does is it takes whatever's in the string and interprets it as MATLAB code and then tries to calculate the uh, x-intercepts from there. However, the preferred method is going to be if you use anonymous functions. They're a lot easier to work with than strings, especially for the um, code for your computer. It'll be easier to work with anonymous functions like that. And then right here, I have some examples of what happens when we use f0 with functions that never cross 0. So first right here, uh, x squared plus 4 is a function that doesn't even touch 0 whatsoever. So let's see what happens here. Um, and you get a not a number or infinity value was encountered during a search. So really, probably what's happening here is that the function, um, or sorry, that f0 is trying to figure out where it uh, actually crosses zero, and eventually the interval that it, it has to widen the interval of its search so much that it eventually hits uh, what MATLAB considers as infinity. So, and that's the, the reason why that is, is because x squared plus four does not cross the um, does not cross the x axis. So we can actually do f plot of x squared plus four. Let's say from negative five to five again. If we do that, you'll see uh, words. Something about this seems off. Um, oh, yeah, because I forgot to make it an anonymous uh, make it an anonymous function. That is my bad. Let's try this again. There we go. You'll see that it bottoms out right here at x equals 4. It's a, it's not good. It's not a very good way to see it, but um, right here, uh, it's x squared plus 4. So when x is 0, uh, x squared plus 4 is 4, and that's the lowest value that the entire thing will be. Um, so now let's take a look at another function that never crosses 0. This is a x, f of x equals x squared, and it never crosses 0. It just touches 0 and goes back up. So it goes... As x goes from the negative direction towards 0, x squared goes from positive infinity towards 0, and then it touches 0 when x equals 0, and then it goes back up in the positive direction. So let's take a look at what happens when we try to calculate the zeros of this. And again, we get a not a number value or infinity. Um, function value at this extremely large number is infinite. Um, it's not actually infinite mathematically, but MATLAB sees that the value is so big it just considers it to be infinite. So that's what's going on there. Um, basically, you can only use f0 when the function crosses 0, so just putting that out there. All right, so the next topic is finding the local minimum, uh, sorry, finding the minimum of a function, whether it's the local minimum or a local maximum. 
And this works a little bit similar to how finding the zeros of a function or solving a function went, where we're basically going to give an approximation of where the min is pretty close to, and then MATLAB's going to do its magic to figure out where the uh, minimum actually is. So what I have on the screen right now is I actually have uh, the same function from before. Uh, actually, no, sorry, it's a new function. This is uh, x cubed minus 12x squared plus 40.25x minus 36.5. And as you can see, there's a uh, global minimum down at zero, a local maximum somewhere around two and a half, a uh, local, sorry, local maximum somewhere around two and a half, a local minimum somewhere around six, and a global maximum somewhere around eight. At least on the interval uh, zero and eight, those are the global minimums and global maximums here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the f, the f min bound, which is a function that given a certain, uh, given an anonymous function or a string expression of some function and uh, an, a lower and upper bound um, basically, it tells us where the local minimum of that function is, at least the local minimum between the lower and upper bounds. So uh, we're working with a f min bound right here. Function is an anonymous function or a string expression like before. Um, I'm just going to show anonymous functions right now. x1 and x2 represent the interval. So x1 is the lower bound, x2 is the upper bound, and there is a minimum somewhere in between x1 and x2 inclusive. And then x is the exact x value of that uh, minimum. So what also, um, sorry, there's also another usage of it, which you can actually ask it for two values instead of just one. Uh, sorry, two outputs instead of just one. If you ask it for two outputs, you get the same x as before, where x is the x value of the minimum, but you also get the y value of the minimum, or basically f of x, or the function applied to x. So I have the anonymous function right here. I have, I mean, you've had plenty of time to see it plotted out. And let's take a look at trying to find the minimum. So the local min before is somewhere around six, but just to be safe, I put it at, uh, I put the bounds at between four and six. So that should give us a pretty good picture of where that value is. So if I uncomment this code and run it, um, let's see. Why didn't that work? Let's find out. Actually, oh, why don't I stop plotting it? So I'm going to clear out this uh, plot for now. Oh, it's because I have a semicolon there. But what we can do is we can print um, x and fl, like so. We get that x equals 5.6073, and f applied to x is negative 11.8045. So that is the point where the min is is at 5.6073 and negative 11.8045. And if we um, display the graph again, we'll see that uh, that is pretty much right about where that is. We can see that at right around 5.6 is where the um, local min of that function is. If we want to take a look at the global min, uh, since this function is actually being plotted from uh, x equals 0 to x equals 8, we can actually take a look at the minimum value across the entire interval from 0 to 8. I'm actually going to remove the semicolon this time so we can take a look and see that, um, ah, right. Uh, so sometimes it's a little bit finicky uh, in the way that it calculates everything. It's a lot better finding local mins than it is global mins, and the reason why is because it's uh, trying to narrow it down from both sides. So it has to do with um, basically as it changes the intervals, taking a look at how the function basically reacts. So if the global minimum is sort of like what it's like for this graph, where the uh, global minimum is at uh, x equals zero, say, then um, and we're plotting it at x, uh, starting at x equals zero, then it's going to have trouble identifying that that is a global min. So basically what you want to do is you want to find a local min or a global min that is somewhere within the bounds of your equation. So now if we were to look at, let's say, um, let's say f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 4, uh, sorry, 2 times x minus 4. 
uh, like we had before. Um, and let's change this from negative uh, 5 to 5. So I'll plot out f from negative 5 to 5 as well, so we can see what that looks like again. Nope. Just like so. So right here we can see that at, um, x equals 1 is right where that minimum is, and that x equals 1, y equals negative 5. So this is an example where the global min is within the interval, and we're actually able to calculate the global min right there. Um, we could also do something like uh, x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x squared minus 2 times x plus, or minus 4. Let's take a look what this looks like. Uh, how about this? I'm sort of just freehanding this function here. Uh, let's see what happens here. Uh, right. It's close. Uh, minus 4 times x squared. There we go. So this is a really uh, this is a really interesting pattern right here. Um, let me make that larger. See what happens here. There we go. Look at that. So from negative 5 to 5, you can see that there's a global minimum right around here at negative 262.1. And then it comes up. There's a local min right here at right around somewhere like 2.5. And it comes up. But because we're looking at the entire interval over which we're graphing this, we can see that the minimum of this entire thing is right around at negative 4.467. All right, so what happens if we're trying to find the maximum, ma uh, sorry, the maximum of a function? Well, MATLAB doesn't actually have anything that helps us find any, any uh, maximum points of a function. Um, so what we, we have to be a little bit creative. Um, I want to point out that what I've done is I've gone back to the original version of f from the local min problem. So this is f of x equals x cubed minus 12x squared. Uh, plus 40.25x minus 36.5. So this is the equation that we were looking at before. So if we try to find the local maximum of this, MATLAB doesn't actually have a built-in function to find the local maximum. But what we can know is that if we flip this function upside down, or if we multiply it by negative 1, we can actually find the minimum of that flipped upside down function and that will be a maximum of the original function. So what I've done here is I've defined g, which is basically equal to negative 1 times f. So g will basically take any output that f has and multiply it by negative 1, effectively flipping it over. So if we take a look at what the results of this looks like, uh, you'll see that g of x equals f of x, but upside down. And you can see that actually modeled really nicely with the um, x and y, or sorry, with the y values over here. But g of x is literally f of x flipped upside down. So if we're trying to find a local maximum for x, we can actually use the local minimum right around uh, somewhere between 1 and 3 for g and multiply the, um, the f val that we get out of g by negative 1 to then get the uh, f val for f. So that's the plan right here. Um, basically, after all, the sub, after all the splotting stuff, I have the code that does that. So what we do here is we first find the, um, the local minimum of g between 1 and 3, and then we set that equal to x and fl. x will remain the same for f, but uh, f, uh, f's fl, or f's y value, we'll, ha we'll have to multiply that by negative 1. So I display that right here with a nice handy-dandy f printout. So let's take a look at the results of this. And we see that the local max for f is 2.392725 and uh, 4.804255. Uh, if we take a look at the original value for f val, it's actually negative 4. Point, in this case, negative 4.8043, since uh, we're using format short right here rather than floats uh, standard uh, six digits of precision. We're using four digits of, I guess, uh, four decimal points rather than six decimal points is the more accurate way to say that. But if we rerun this calculation using 0.4f, you'll see that it matches up with the original value of f val, which is g's uh, y value for its for g's local minimum. And if we verify this with f of x, we can see that oh, we can see that it is just about on target. 
it's hard to actually get the, exactly there with the mouse, but that is, uh, we, we can estimate that it's very close to this, and well, I guess MATLAB actually gives us the full answer, so there's no need to estimate. So that's finding the local minimum and local maximum. To find the local minimum of a function, you use fmin bound. Uh, to find the local maximum, you make a new function that is basically just negative one times the original function, and then use fmin bound anyway. All right, so our next topic is integration, and we're going to talk about three methods to integrate over functions. Um, the first two practically just do the same thing. The only main difference is that the methods of calculation that they use are slightly different, but really they're, they're functionally pretty much the same as far as uh, we're concerned. So basically we're looking at the quad or quad L functions. Uh, this is a letter L, not a number one at the end of quad L. But um, they both take in the exact same parameters that do the exact same thing and they give back the exact same ro uh, results. So the uh, function parameter is a string expression or anonymous function. The caveat being is that it must use entirely matrix operations. And the reason why is that this function actually has to be able to take in a vector and successfully do calculations over that vector rather than just being a single value. So that means your function must use uh, element by element or matrix operations entirely. Um, an example of this is on line 66 right here when I've defined f. This is the same function that we've been using before except for the fact that now everything is in terms of matrix operations. So I, you have the, the period exponential, the, the element by element exponential, element by element. Uh, well, in this case, this is scalar by matrix multiplication, so that doesn't matter matrix addition and subtraction also doesn't matter too much, but the main change here is the element by element power uh, operation that we've done right here. So it's really important to notice the difference between what I'm doing here versus what I did before. Uh, when you're doing integration, these all have to be matrix operations. So you have to be really careful to make sure everything that needs to be element by element is element by element. Uh, so multiplication, division, and exponential. Ex exponentiation should all be element by element uh, in integration. So that's uh, the function. A and B are lower and upper bounds for integration, where A is the lower bound and B is the upper bound, and Q is the value of the integral of the function uh, from A to B. So you integrate the function, the, the given function, and then you basically do the integration at B minus the integration at A, just like you might have done in calculus, except MATLAB does it all for you. So what I have right here are, you know, I've, I've given um, the value of this function and I'm going to calculate the integration of that function from 1 to 7. So we'll take a look at what this code does and as you can see, the two answers are exactly the same. Uh, we can actually check, or they're very, they're similar within reason. We can actually check to see if they are the same. Um, and MATLAB says that they're not exactly the same. So it looks like there's some uh, there's something somewhere where they're not exactly the same. If we do format long, we can try to figure out what's going on. Um, let's move this back down here and see what the difference is between these two answers. And it looks like all the way down at this position here, it looks like there's a, just a little bit of difference um, caused by the two different methods that quad and quad L use to calculate the integration. But that's such a small difference that it's it's one that we can say is pretty much negligible. So in short, quad and quad L for the most part don't really we don't really need to worry too much about the differences between the two, just use whichever one the uh, assignments tell you to. I believe in the lab it's mostly quad L. But yeah. And then the third integration method is actually a little bit different. So uh, we'll talk about trap, uh, trap Z next, which uh, trap Z stands for trapezoid. What it does is this one actually takes in a series of points. It extrapolates a function from those points, and then it um, uh, calculates the integration over all of those points. So what it does is between every adjacent set of points, it's actually draw, going to draw a straight line. So for example, it draws a straight line from 2, 4 to 4, negative 2, and then it calculates the area of that trapezoid, basically. The trapezoid formed by that line segment, the line segment uh, 0, 2, and 0, 4. Oh, sorry, 
the line segment uh, from 2, 0 to 2, 4, and the line segment of uh, 2, 4, well, words, I can't speak very well. But basically, it divides, it plots all the, you can think of it as plotting all these points, drawing lines between all the points, and then calculating the areas of the, uh, the areas underneath the trapezoids or triangles that are formed by connecting these uh, points to the x-intercept. So this is a very quick example um, where I just plugged in a bunch of points right here and we get the value of the integral out of them. So this is the area under the entirety of the function defined by those points and by drawing straight lines between adjacent points like so. All right, our last topic in this chapter is ordinary differential equations. So this example I'm working on is from page 304 from the textbook, so I would highly recommend you take a look at that if you want to look at some of the more complex math behind what's going on here. But the long and short of it is basically, if we're given a differential function, uh, dy dt, where uh, t is an independent variable and y is a dependent variable, we're also given the range of values for t and an, and an initial y value, such that, um, uh, d, uh, sorry, we know that the function applied to the lowest value in the range equals that initial y value. Basically, what we do is we can ask MATLAB, hey, given this dy dt, given this range of t, given the initial y value, uh, tell us what function this came from. So give us uh, y, the y equals f of t that this function came from. Uh, the reason why we're using t and y is... That's sort of just standard notation, uh, at least in terms of the textbook, it's pretty standard notation. Um, we're just using t as an independent variable, some might refer to it as time or something like that. But regardless, um, words, regardless, I, I guess in summary, we are taking a derivative of a function uh, along with a certain set of bounds for the function's input and an initial value for the output. We're basically trying to find the function out of that. So what I've done right here is I have defined the derivative of the function as a, a two input function. Um, it's basically we're saying this is t cubed minus 2y divided by t is the derivative function. So again the function for this actually has to be in the form of a two input function. So in this case it's a function that takes in t and y and it gives out a uh, value defined by both t and y. However, um, t is known as the independent value and y is known as the dependent value because t actually determines what y's value is. So we have this derivative function and if we want to figure out the original function we use the ODE45 function. Now the textbook gives a lot of functions for solving ODE and so uh, let me actually try to look at some examples here if I can find them in my mess of tabs. Let's see. You can't see it on OBS right now, but it's really rough. Let's see. There's ODE 45, 23, 113, 15S, 23S, 23T, 23TB. And all of these, basically, they're used for slight variances in problems or different methods to solve different problems. Um, don't worry too much about it other than the fact that we're just using ODE45. So ODE45 is the is our go-to function for this. So ODE45, we pass in the function that calculates dy dt in terms of y and t. We calculate the range of values. Uh, we, we pass in the range of values. So t span is going to be a vector containing t0, t1, t2, t3, t4, t5, etc, etc, all the way until tf, which is the final value of t where this, uh, this vector is actually in increasing order. t0 is the first, x, uh, first t value, t1 is the second t value, and so on and so on until tf is the largest and final t value. And then y0 is just an initial value that we know, uh, such that we know that whatever f is, whatever the function that we're trying to get out of it is, that f applied to t0 is equal to y0. So f applied to the initial value of t, equals our initial value of y. So this is given, this will be given information for us, as well as t span and our uh, given uh, dy dx function, or sorry, dy dt function. 
The result of this is t, y, which are basically a set of ordered pairs where t is the same, the exact same thing as our t span, and y is basically equal to f applied to everything in the t vector. And everything in t, y basically gives us ordered points that when put together define the function that we're looking for. So, um, what I have right here is I have, I, I basically call the function, so ODE45 dy dt, uh, t being, let me see, where did I define this? I did not define it as it looks, it, it appears. So let's say, words, oh, that's right. Uh, I put the definition of t up here. So let's say we're looking at um, t equals 1.013, uh, like that. So this will be 1, 1.01, 1.02, 1.03, etc., etc., all the way until 3, uh, where our function, we know that our function applied to 1 equals 4.2, and um, this is just the value, the, t, the range of t values that we're looking at. And if we, here, I'm going to uh, comment these out for now, comment all that out as well, and we can look a, take a look at what the result of this is. And there's a lot of results, so actually let's just take a look at 0.5 first as our separation for t. So you can see uh, t values are 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3, and these are all of our y values that are associated with t. So f applied to 1 is 4.2 f applied to 1.5 is equal to 2.452, etc., etc., and so on and so on. And we can actually take all these points and extrapolate an equation out of it. Now, given that this is a, um, this would actually turn out to be a cubic. So it's t cubed divided by t minus 2y divided by t. And if you solve that for y in some way, you're eventually going to get a, a t cubed term out of that again. So we'd be expecting the, the uh, original function that produced this derivative to be some sort of, uh, we, we would expect that to be some degree four polynomial. So what I actually did was I used the polyfit function from chapter eight in order to fit a fourth degree polynomial over this. And then I used some of the similar methods that we did in chapter eight in order to basically calculate the uh, plot, or basically calculate yeah, we take we take the polynomial that um, we take this polynomial that we fit to um, we take the polynomial that we fit to our values of t and y, and we take the value basically of that polynomial, um, and then actually to be honest, I don't know why I did that. There is a very good reason. I don't think it was very necessary. But actually, oh no, because I did want to look at uh, fitting the polynomial. That's right. So p, so y are the actual uh, y values here, and p y is the values that we get when we actually fit the polynomial to our uh, t and y. So we can take a look, and oh, that's right. I should uh, change this back to 0.01. Let's try taking a look at that again. And uh, words. Maybe that's a little too much. Let's try one more time. There we go. You can see pretty much a perfect fit, almost a perfect fit, uh, of this fourth degree polynomial for all of these points. And actually, if we just, um, let's just take a look at the points by themselves. So I'm going to do a uh, plot of t and y. Let's see what MATLAB gives us there. MATLAB gives us this really nice, smooth, curve. So this is the function that actually, the derivative of which produces our dy dt, which is t cubed minus 2y two, uh, two all over t. So that is the math behind uh, ordinary differential equation problems. You'll see a couple of those in the, um, in the lab, in lab 9, and basically that's just going to be a plug and chug of sorts. All right, well, that was all of chapter nine, um, all, all sorts of numerical analysis type of stuff. I hope you all enjoyed and have a wonderful rest of your day.